This is the Dreadful Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we are talking about Lovecraft Country, Season 1, Episode 5, Strange Case. I am curious. I saw the money I left still in the nightstand. Why didn't you use any of it? Didn't have to. I enjoyed my entire day using the only currency that I needed. Whiteness. I don't know what is more difficult. Being colored or being a woman. Most days I'm happy to be both, but the world keeps interrupting. And I am sick of being interrupted. So what's next for Ruby? I interrupted. Welcome back, fellow Dreadfuls. Yes, magic exists. And this is the Dreadful Podcast from TV Podcast Industries, where we are looking at Strange Case, episode five of season one of Lovecraft Country. We are your magic for this evening, where we will delve deep into Lovecraft Country and this strange case. And I am one of your strange hosts, John. I'm definitely another strange host, Derek. Yeah, strange case indeed for this week's episode. Lots to talk about. Definitely a spoiler filled lots to talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, what a great episode this was. I, for one, absolutely loved this episode. I for two. Um, and <laughs> dare I say it? Maybe Ruby is a new hero of mine. Um, so <laughs> yeah. just so so good yeah. great to see her character get an episode and what an episode but we will definitely get into that but just before we do remember fellow dreadfuls please share the podcast to share the love uh, you can subscribe rate us leave a review on any good or evil podcast catcher of your choice we are on spotify we are on google play and apple podcasts mm -hmm. please head on over to those and subscribe. We are also on Patreon. Uh, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash TV Podcast Industries. And of course, if you want to, pop on over to our website to tvpodcastindustries.com where you can also listen to the podcast. Exactly. exactly. And we'd love to hear your thoughts about the series. We're halfway through this season of Lovecraft Country. If you want to email us, you can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com with any thoughts that you have about the series so far. We've been really lucky to get these first five episodes in advance of the release of the show. So uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on the rest of the season as we go through. And hopefully you're enjoying the show as much as we are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we definitely hope you're enjoying this show. Mm -hmm. um, certainly I am. And uh, yes, well. Derek has just said it himself. So. <laughs> yeah, we have been getting some feedback. You have heard some feedback from from our other listeners uh, throughout the series. You'll hear some more feedback later on. And everybody seems to be really positive on this show uh, for the most part. You know, this feels like one of those shows like we had last year with uh, with Watchmen. It feels like one of the shows that seems to be building uh, in terms of its audience getting really intrigued by it. It is a very confusing show. You definitely seem to have to watch the episodes twice to pick up on everything that's going on. And we've definitely done that for this episode. Watch this episode three times, I think, uh, to get everything that we think we need to pull out from the episode overall. Yes, we have. But first off, Derek, what are some of the episode details? Yes, let's get into episode five, Strange Case. The episode was directed by Cheryl Dunye. Uh, I've not seen much of her work, but recently she worked with our own Misty Knight, Simone Misek, on the controversial CBS show All Rise. Do you know why this show is controversial, John? Do you remember the story? 
on the No, news. I don't. Um, obviously, I know Misty Knight from Marvel Netflix uh, Iron Fist, which mm-hmm. uh, she was great in that. And uh, Luke Cage, yeah. And yeah. The Defenders, yeah. She's all exactly. over the place on the Marvel Netflix stuff, yeah. Uh, now, All Rise was controversial this year when uh, half of the writing staff walked out because of the portrayal of people of color on that show. So uh, ah, big, I did not know that. Yeah, big, big news story. Um, they were very unhappy with the way the words that they were making um, people of color say and, uh, and and other people on the show. And all the writers said, no longer going to take this. We have to be better than that. So big controversy. Hopefully they'll get that fixed in the future and have uh, have those writers back. Because apparently it's doing really, really well in the US with the wonderful Simone Missick. So, uh, yeah, great actor. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the teleplay for the episode was written by Misha Green once again, the showrunner for the show, uh, Jonathan I. Kidd and Sonia Winton, uh, all writers on the show, so all been involved uh, over the last couple of episodes as well. Good stuff. John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with the synopsis for the episode? For sure. After making a devil's bargain with William, Ruby steps into the charmed stiletto shoes of a white woman, <laughs> but her transformation only fortifies her resentment of the racial divide. A betrayal by Montrose unleashes Atticus's pent-up rage, leaving Letty deeply disturbed and sending Montrose into the comforting arms of his secret lover. A lot of the times the synopsis don't give much away about the episode, but that is effectively the episode. There's two main beats in the show, really. It's everything that happens to Ruby, everything that happens to Montrose, and and just a little bit with Atticus and Letty in the episode, just leading us through the main storyline of the series, really. But, uh, but yeah, really, it's going to be split into two sections, which works really well when there's two podcasters talking about an episode of a show, because uh, one of us gets one point and one of us gets the other, right? Yeah, exactly. It is a great split for us works on great. this one. Yeah, works great. John, which one are you taking of the two major moments or major storylines for the episode? I'm taking transformation. Yes, this Mm -hmm. is Ruby waking up as a white woman and certainly freaking out um, as she is looking over her skin, looking in the mirror. Uh, What a really interesting deal Mm -hmm. that she has made with William here, whether she expected it would turn out in this way. Assumingly not, as she is in freak mode. And certainly that moment where she walks out into the street um, from her house into the the local neighborhood and you just see how odd she feels. Um, The the old behaviors remain um, and and the whole incident with the cops where, you know, she immediately, along with the the kid who has knocked her over, um, both put their hands up and, and you see the response of the 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 police to that um it's just the auto response of everybody on the street isn't it when the cops get out of the car everybody just stands there and puts their hands up you know as if something really bad's going to happen here we're going to make sure that we're safe by putting our hands up you know and there's that whole conversation that's been going on for decades as well and still going on today sadly but it's that whole moment of we need to stay clear of the situation because these guys are volatile and have guns on them you know definitely i mean that odd behavior um, you know, she just doesn't know how to inhabit that skin. Everyone's staring at her. Mm-hmm. I mean, she even goes up to someone and says, I'm Ruby. Yeah. Um, and obviously, even if the person did know Ruby would be kind of going, no, you're not. Yeah. Uh, and I, this, this was really so, so good throughout this episode. This whole oddness, um, or awkwardness, uh, or trying to get to grips with that situation even as she becomes more comfortable with it, mm-hmm. uh, was just done absolutely uh, to a T by Wunmi Masaku. Just so, so good. She's so good in the show. I keep forgetting she's British. She's Nigerian-British. She won a BAFTA award a couple of years ago. I actually looked at her speech on, on, on YouTube just to hear her British accent. And yes, she's absolutely British. So really pulling off the accent really well. And some of her reactions in the show have been fantastic, especially in this episode. So much great stuff in here. We joked about that moment last week when she was so angry on stage that nobody was giving her applause and she just says F you to everybody as she walks away you know yeah it's been playing a really fun part for the last few episodes but this is 100% her episode she's so good yeah I mean she played it to a T um, and I, I think the the old behaviors that remain trying to find new ones I think was done really well mm-hmm. even that awkwardness with her her new colleagues the white girls of the department store oh, yeah, yeah. but also with Tamara as well um it was just really really well done because 
it was so complicated for her in, mm-hmm. in trying to sort this through her mind. You know, on the one hand, trying to fit in with the other white ladies, uh, but having to listen to their casual racism oh. or trying to empathize with Tamara, but ultimately getting angry with her because she finds out, for example, that she hadn't done all of these tests around accountancy and so on that she had done yeah. to try and get that same job. And also trying to appear not to be maybe too sympathetic um, with Tamara's hiring. Yeah. You know, we, we, we get that information that a number of people in the store who'd worked for them had left when uh, the department store changed its policy on yeah. hiring people of color. So this was this was really so well played. Yeah, because she's so jealous of Tamara getting the job. That's kind of the reason why it's so forefront of her mind. She had that conversation last week uh, with William at the bar, effectively getting so angry about the idea that this girl just walked in off the street on a whim and got the job in there. And you tell now from the interview that she had that she's been working towards something like this for years, it sounds like. All of the qualifications that she has, yeah. all the courses she took, and she kind of questions tomorrow about it. You know, she gives her that first moment when they meet to have that kind of conversation where she's saying, you know, I hope you still feel part of the family here kind of thing in the persona of Hillary, telling her, you know, I hope you feel okay, and then asking her how many courses did she take <laughs> and Tamara's responding to her going, I didn't even know those were available kind of thing. Exactly. And you can see her just getting more and more angry at this idea that this girl is in this position, which made other people quit from the, from the organization. Exactly. And Ruby's kind of going, I could handle that. I could absolutely be in your position and I would know what I've attained. You don't seem to understand what you've attained, you know? Exactly. And even in the police car after that initial incident right at the start where she's been taken back to her husband, mm. uh, in this case, William. And again, with the, with the police, the, the awkwardness around it. But then yeah. the, the great thing here and the start of what runs through this episode is the fits, mm-hmm. the, 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 the cracking, the clicking as she is starting to transform back into Ruby. Um, she takes the name of Hillary as, as a white woman. Yeah. But as she is transformed back to or begins the transformation back to, to Ruby, it, it becomes all the way through this more graphic and uh, extended versions of the process mm-hmm. of what happens. Um, proper and, body horror, like a, a it, really, it really I, is. I yeah. really wanted to look up who the special effects people were on, the, on this episode or on the show so far because they've done such good work here. There's a couple of moments in the episode, particularly um, that I'm sure we'll probably talk about, but but the, her her metamorphosis as the skin drops off her face. Uh, I think there's one, the third transformation that she does, the kind of final one she does outside the bar, particularly where it feels just monstrous. What's happening to this character? It really does feel like they they put. Uh, Wunmi Osaku in the body of this other woman and ripped it off her. Like it, it looks so violent and brutal. So painful, so yeah. violent. I mean, I did think, um, that something was gonna pop out in the police car. I yeah. thought that Ruby was gonna be a goner. And certainly when William takes out the knife on her first transformation back and it Absolutely. was just really incredibly done, you know, as it moves through seeing um, this change first in the department store just after she's been hired by the manager and she, she has to race off as she is beginning to transform and you kind of just get part of the face falls off. Mm-hmm. And then on the south side, when they all go out for, for, for drinks, uh-huh. you, you get the moment where you see all this skin falling off. And again, when she tenders her awesome res- resignation, uh, to, uh, the manager, uh, where yeah. that stiletto heel that I mentioned in the synopsis, that stiletto shoe is pushed repeatedly where the sun doesn't shine. Um, and, uh, yes, he, he certainly gets, uh, his comeuppance here, uh, as she hands in her resignation. And as the skin is falling off, um, and she turns around and says, I just want to, I just wanted you to know that it was a, 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 a black bitch that did this to you. Be- and that's the reference back to him calling Tamara that as they've been out on the south side of Chicago mm-hmm. uh, to one of the colored bars uh, and he's making a pass at her uh, and she uh, bites him uh, as he tries to kiss 
uh, and runs away and he, yeah. he, he shouts after her. And I think that, um, that shot, that tracking shot of her feet in the shoes with the skin dropping on the floor, mm -hmm. I just thought was absolutely awesome. And, fantastic, and yeah. all these shots were of her metamorphosing, uh, all these shots were of her transforming or meta or, or, or of the metamorphosis was so, so good. I mean, at one point it, it looked like Carrie at the end right, uh, yeah. in the school theater where she's covered in blood. Totally covered in blood. Uh, yeah. Really, really so graphic. Yeah. Um, and this is the deal with the devil with, with William. He casually does say that he will expect a favor in return for the use of this potion. Mm -hmm. And, and he certainly gets that this deal with the devil, uh, to attend a party and, uh, I must say, I thought that was a, a nice little moment where he goes, there's, there's a box with your name on it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's this big box with a bow. You expect a very elegant, uh, party. dress. Yeah. And he's just said that I want you to attend a party. And in the end, it's work clothes to be a waitress for, for the night at mm -hmm. the Captain Lancaster, the police captain's office. She's being asked to effectively hide what to me, it was a stone. It felt like it could be a hex or something in order to do something to, uh, Captain Lancaster. We, we hear that from Christine that he left William's body, uh, for dead. She pulled him back to life. Mm. And, uh, there's certainly some interesting stuff here as, as she's planting this, this stone. Which seems to be that it's going to be for revenge because Christine pulls that out, you know, that he wants revenge. Yeah. That she goes into the closet. Now we've been in his office before and we heard the banging. There was that great shot that looked like he was looking out a window through Venetian blinds. Yeah. When in fact it's a cupboard with the, the slats. It's a, a, a closet with that, those slatted doors. That's right. And Ruby in this moment thinking on her feet runs into the closet where there is this Frankenstein type person in the yes. closet with the stitches around the neck and across the face. Yeah. And we actually see that the police captain also seemingly has a different head stitched onto his body. That's what it looks like, doesn't it? It, it like, really does. Like you see it through the slats. I'm sure, you know, this is one of the things that, you know, we see it in this episode, probably come back in another episode in the future. Um, yeah, it looks like a completely different colored body that he has, uh, or hairy body or a very hairy or a very, yeah. very or different colored body. But, um, but yeah, it looks like there's been some a proper burr, really. I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, but definitely a lot of experimentation seems to be going on in this office in this chapter of the sons of Adam, I suppose. Yeah, it, it was really interesting because there's, it feels to me like there's a lot of connective tissue being openly put out on display for yeah. the audience here because for episode three we see the the people who had been experimented on by the dr epstein yes uh, who again it's different pieces of bodies attached in different places mm -hmm. you know the baby's head on the footballer's body oh yeah and here can we forget john can we forget? Yeah, exactly here it feels like similar kind of stuff uh, has been going on mm -hmm. and the interesting thing as well is the, that doctor, William does talk about having worked with him on this transformation, Hiram uh, Epstein. potion. Yeah, yeah. Hiram Epstein. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that the potion mimics this metamorphosis that, uh, allows them to change. So it's, it's really, uh, there's a little bit of connective tissue being built up here in, in the writing and in the story, which Absolutely. I really, really liked, yeah. uh, as well. But yeah, a lot of this episode kind of spoke to me of, if you go through something as major as Letty and Atticus have gone through in the last couple of episodes, tell your loved ones all about it. Give them all the information, because <laughs> it seems here, if Ruby had known who William was, because obviously Letty and, and uh, Atticus had their run-in with William uh, back in, in the first couple of episodes, they knew who he was, firstly, and had warned her about a tall, blonde-haired guy, a blonde-haired, good-looking guy, whatever the warning would need to be, then maybe Ruby would have gone home with him. Um, also, this Hiram Epstein was the person in their house that uh, that had murdered the eight people that were in, in the basement below. Again, if she'd known about the name Hiram Epstein, she may have seen, you know, warning flags maybe about about going and dealing with, the, dealing with William. But it seems like William has targeted her because 
they need a piece of equipment from the house. So remember back uh, in, in episode three, Christina went to the house to get this um Aurory, is that what it's called? The solar system model? Yes. yes, the mechanical model of the solar system, yeah. Yeah, she tried to get that from Letty, but Letty couldn't, uh, well, Letty, the house was blocking her from getting in because of what the uh, the priestess had done the previous time. Uh, she was blocked from getting in, so Letty told her she couldn't come in. Christina was looking for the Aurory. Now, William seems to be targeting the other person in the household who doesn't know any of this information, so potentially... It's also another favor that he's looking for. It's not just the planting of the stone in the captain's house. He may also be looking for a way into the house to get that orrery, which they still think is in the house, even though Hippolyta has that, right? With with her daughter Dee, they have the the uh, orrery. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a weird word to say. It I really guess. is, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, but this... For me, this, this whole, uh, thing with, um, with Ruby was just so fascinating, mm-hmm. uh, and so interesting. Th- this idea that not only is the, the physical transformation, but Ruby does have to mimic how she behaves, you know, to try and remove those old behaviors or, or, um, just how she speaks. You see that in her interview where she talks about Letty and me and says, Letty and I and corrects herself. That kind of thing. Yeah, she um, says, says something like, uh, Letty and I were dragged to, and then goes, I mean, my sister and I were driven down to the shop. <laughs> it's a very, like, I need to correct myself here. I'm not talking in, in the right way uh, in this situation. But it, again, speaks to the privilege, I suppose, and this is what uh, Ruby's going through. You know, the idea that she went in for an interview looking to work on the counter and then is given an assistant manager job off the bat. You know, Ruby's like kind of going, okay, yeah, definitely. I'll take that. Um, but then she has to act, as you mentioned earlier on, she has to act in a completely different way around the white women who are not, not just, um, casually racist or not just hiding it. They're openly racist about the fact they want to get rid of this girl, Tamara. They wouldn't leave their jobs for it. Uh, but, you know, get her out of here kind of thing is, is what they're saying. Hopefully they don't hire anybody else like her, you know? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, that whole thing is, is fascinating. It's also just, you know, she, she has a really great line to, to William after the first time, you know, he, he, he basically, after she wakes up for the first time, uh, from the incident where she's been brought back to Williams from the police, she's, she's returned to her normal body. William leaves money and potion are on the size drawers effectively giving her the choice that she can just simply take the money or she can take the potion i personally would take both uh it'd be great to know what you would choose uh fellow dreadfuls yeah. I, think, um, I think he actually was was intending that she took both it was maybe take yeah. the potion and use all the money that you want to have whatever day you want in the new skin kind of thing but but after her first outing uh where she knows she's going to change into a white woman mm-hmm. she comes back and says I don't know what's more difficult, being black or being a woman, but mm-hmm. life keeps interrupting. There's a great moment later on um, where Christine is saying about the fact that Ruby, Ruby's giving out to her and, and Christine's kind of saying, you know, you've what you've done, you've done, you've gone and got that job and, and this is how you've operated yeah so far and she goes william's invitation was not just to be white Mm -hmm. but to do whatever you like exactly um she says magic gives you that freedom who are you ruby uninterrupted Mm -hmm. um and that's when she goes off and tenders her resignation with the the department store manager in in that great scene so it, it, yeah. it well it is that well some people might like that you know it was certainly very s and m but uh, uh i think i don't think anybody likes that how the end went <laughs> no i i'm not i'm sure they don't but you know it's it's really really good um uh, the interesting thing ruby as hillary davenport mm-hmm. uh, was played by the the lady who was in the village with the dogs and uh, keeping Montrose prisoner. Yes, same De- lady. Del, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was the was the character. Yeah, it was weird, wasn't it? It was kind of one of those ones where you're going when she wakes up and it is her. You're going, I've seen her before. Was that the yeah. lady in, in episode was two? So. The actor uh, Jamie Newman. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that was really good to see um, her back. But and weird though, it feels almost yeah. like there's been a portal to bring her to the place. Like I know um, in the conversation with Ruby that uh, William mentions that uh, what Hiram Epstein was doing was creating portals. Was creating 
creating magical doorways almost. So is that what happened here is that she's not being a white woman. She's she's kind of the the character of Dell from the town has been or her persona or her what's the word visage or body has been transported, I suppose, from the town outside of uh, of Ardham Lodge or Ardham House. Yeah, I, yeah. Cool. Well, it, but it says it does mimic uh, metamorphosis. Uh, that's yeah. that's what he he says, and I presume that's why it's almost like a skin over her. But exactly. the, this transformation is so so good. I, I I just can't stop talking about it. I mean, it it really does to me. You know, the the, the great horrors like something like werewolves mm-hmm. that that transformation or. Even Silence of the Lambs with Buffalo Bill and okay. even with the Death Head Moth, again, the, the symbol of Caterpillar, the chrysalid coming into the butterfly, which mm-hmm. is described by by William here, uh, that idea that Buffalo Bill wanted to transform himself. Um, you, you've got um, the, the spiritual animals from First Peoples in... Um, in North America and mm-hmm. other cultures around the world, this idea of transforming into their spiritual animal. You know, we've just recently done Penny Dreadful City of Angels, and there is the notion that uh, Mama Vega, who is, um, th- you know, the, the, the main mother uh, of the Vega family in that show, her happy. spiritual animal is a coyote. Mm-hmm. And th- there was suggestions that she would, be able to change into that you know draw upon that spirit yeah yeah but even within that first line of atticus talking about books this idea that everyone in some ways imagines being someone else at some point yeah. whether it's through reading a book and trying to inhabit that character about mm-hmm. how they feel and how they would react or just with um, imagination or dare i say it, jealousy in the sense of i want to be that rich this is what i would do Absolutely. that this idea um is really really interesting yeah. uh, to me and i i find the whole thing massively fascinating yeah. um and yeah. i thought it was played absolutely so well by one me masaku and uh jamie newman here mm-hmm. it was Really, really good. It's really good. And, and you're right, the whole metamorphosis thing was just all across the episode. Did you notice on the on the news when she was doing her transformation on the floor with the plastic all around it? The first time she transformed back, uh, the news story was about uh, locusts who were about who were yes. leaving uh, Africa and, and heading towards Britain. Um and the the wording that's on the news is effectively that they're uh, that they go into their cocoon and they come out fully formed within a week and they will and after that it's just terror you know that they will destroy all of the crops effectively so it's kind of setting up that this is a terrifying proposition for Ruby that she's going to transform into something monstrous effectively um, and the other thing the other spell that we see in the episode is uh, is William uh, says a few words and creates butterflies in the air so butterflies again being a symbol of metamorphosis as well so tra- translating that into another spell i suppose so uh, yeah it was a fascinating uh, fascinating storyline here you know that that she's able to go into it you know it was a fascinating storyline here but it was really interesting that ruby was trying to keep her per- personality hidden completely especially that those moments with the with the white women in the shop she's not speaking like herself at all she's speaking like they would want her to speak yes in those moments and yeah. that's what christina calls out later christina calls out why did you go into those situations and put yourself in that in those moments say the things you said you had the opportunity to be absolutely whoever you wanted to be and also be a privileged white woman effectively have the privilege of people looking at you and being scared for you, not scared of you, as she describes herself. You know, something very different there. I think Ruby says it herself that the people on the street were trying to help her, not scared of her kind of thing. So, for, yeah. for sure. Um, and I, I like that she takes that and runs with that mm-hmm. in order to, yeah, tender her stiletto resignation. Absolutely. Um, but there is one other transformation here as well in the same way. And... Derek, you called this out on the last episode mm-hmm. where through this episode, Ruby has been saying what's behind the locked door to William. Uh, and we see William coming out um, a bit from this l- locked door. And again, we see him transform into Christine. Yes, we do. Uh, which was another fascinating and amazing bit of special effects and, and, and acting yeah. uh, in 
how Christine and came out of William. Oh, you you okay. have all the skin falling off as well, but you see the lumps moving around the, the body and across the face. And it was almost like Christine was getting her hands and her head into place where William was. Exactly. Um, in order to be able to burst out. So really, uh, amazing amazing imagery i yeah, think absolutely i can't believe i called that uh last week from, I know. from that moment but it was all there it wasn't a massive leap for what was given to us on screen it was just that moment where they were clearly saying there's something between these two we've never seen them on screen together before and, and this kind of show you always got to question those things but uh yeah pretty big shocker that william is christina and christina is william isn't it yeah. like yeah so so we're kind of right the way i explained it in last week's episode the thinking in my mind was that someone as powerful as christina with the magic that she's had would create a way to get her into any situation and being a white guy would be a great way to get her in and out of situations that she couldn't necessarily go into particularly within her family so yeah absolutely well i mean that's that's kind of my main point i transformation runs absolutely across as you were saying this episode mm -hmm. so derek uh what is your transformation uh also something that was suggested in episode four that we completely missed um the moments that we have in this episode with montrose where we where we truly see who he is, I suppose, is kind of the transformation that we, that I think we're seeing on that side of the house. Um, Montrose, obviously, at the beginning of the episode, the uh, repercussions of what happened last week, where he killed Jahima and got rid of the pages, which we didn't know last week, but he got rid of the pages that they'd worked so hard to get in, in Chicago. Um, they no longer have access to everything they worked for, and Montrose is beaten to a pulp by his son um, the reaction from Atticus here uh, turns into complete violence just like we heard about uh, Montrose when he was younger that he would turn to violence on, on many occasions as well so um, it's been referenced a few times over the over the course of the episodes when you think back to it um, that he was quite a sensitive kind of kid when he was younger uh, we heard that from George right back in episode one uh, last week we had the extra passenger um tree who came along with them to chicago kind of mentioning something about a possible relationship between uh montrose and the bartender from episode one we now find out in this episode that that is his secret lover effectively is the bartender from yeah. episode one who's who's been gay and, and and out and everybody seems to know about it from episode one but this is a much more uh scary thing for montrose we see he's going through a lot of pain in this idea that he he could possibly be gay even though he's having sex with his secret lover effectively it is absolutely a secret lover and it feels like he's not accepting it at all uh, he's not accepting this is a part of him at all there's reference in the conversation when they're in i think it's sammy is the name of the bartender when they're in his apartment uh with with montrose and everybody's hanging around and chatting they're talking about the fact that montrose has never kissed sammy at all um so he's obviously clearly as we'll see later on in the episode he's been fighting this idea that he could possibly be gay uh, for most of his life, even though he seems to be very close to what I would definitely consider a relationship with Sammy. Like there's, you know, everybody seems to know who he is, definitely seems to know that they're with each other in some sense, but he's not calling out that it's a relationship. Montrose isn't calling out his relationship. No, not at all. I mean, he he's massively in the closet um, in that sense. But I think this transformation is really interesting because it's an internalized one of, of, of montrose yeah. it, it's that moment where he is able to feel comfortable and accept his homosexuality yeah. the whole thing with sex with sammy um you know it, it's angry sex it's shameful you know he, he doesn't want that intimacy he doesn't want to to kiss him yeah um because you know he he's the struggling with this part of who he is mm -hmm. this is the internal transformation of, of Montrose to accept who he is in terms of his homosexuality. Yeah. Um, I think as both of us as gay men understand that pressure that's released when you finally are able to tell other people that you're gay and mm -hmm. um, the pressure of the, the norms that happen in society 
about having a girlfriend and why haven't you got a girlfriend yeah. and plus a million and one other things. And then you decide to tell them and that fear that they will reject you, yeah. such as your family, your close friends, it, it is one that overrides the the knowledge that most people have that actually your friends and family will accept you. It doesn't happen in all cases, absolutely. And of course, this is back in the 50s, mm-hmm. so it, technically it's still illegal. Yeah. It's also the fact, it's the complication of homosexuality in the coloured community as well as in the wider society. So yeah. it's these layers upon layers of pressure yeah. that Montrose has here. And it's no wonder he likes his sex angry because he's angry. He's an angry person. You, there's all this pressure with Tick lashing out in this episode, but Montrose lashing out at him as he grows up. You know, yeah. Tick, the first episode despises his father he doesn't want to be uh coming back to chicago it's only because he's had a note to say he's been kidnapped the the relationship with his ex-wife and the the potential element that she knew even though he was probably keeping it a secret from her and the possibility that george and his wife had the affair that created atticus so all of this stuff is no wonder this guy is angry drinking uh, that there's so much weighing him down. You absolutely, know? absolutely. I, I love how they've we woven this into the story. You know that the there's certainly a huge amount of uh, abuse of drug abuse that goes on within. Uh, we know from from uh, studies that have happened within uh, closeted homosexuals, closeted gay people. There's a lot of people that turn to drink and drugs to cover all that up uh, to to not have to deal with the situation of being an out gay man. You know. Um, I have to give huge, huge credit to Cheryl Dunya, the director for this episode, because the coming out scene, I guess I'll call it the, the moments where Montrose is in the bar with his friends who are drag queens with his, with his lover, Sammy, who's also a drag queen. Those moments in there are so well judged. There's yeah. so much going on in the scenes with this beautiful soundtrack of Lonely World um, by Moses Sumney is the song that's that's done, which allows the moments to just escalate. You know, you see the kind of fear that's in Montrose's place. And I, I remember the first time I ever went to a gay bar and it's exactly the same feeling. You get there and you're yeah. looking around going, this place is not for me at all. I don't know why I'm here. I just want to go to the pub with my mates. It's so be, scary. It's so yeah. scary, so full of colour, so much vibrance going on around him. And Montrose is just kind of cowering almost in a corner and then kind of breaking out of his shell as the moments go on, as everybody yeah. else feels more free around you. Like a- and as the time goes on, he's there. He he sees it's not a threat and yeah. to become himself. Yeah. I mean, it was a great scene on the dance floor. Yeah. We see him kissing Sammy. We see him dancing with him. And the music in this scene was just phenomenal. It, it really built that kind of release. And with getting all the ticker tape coming down, mm-hmm. You know, it felt there was the the releasing orgasm of being in tune with himself for exactly. the first time. It, it was really, really so well done. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's that um internal change that he's done, and it it it's that kind of concept of the enabler, where that overriding rhetoric that homosexuality is is wrong you know or or homophobia and the same with racism that by being caught up in yourself not wanting to be who you are yeah you enable that narrative to continue absolutely um, in in that sense and it's one of those interesting things which is a really tough idea that you know you can be gay but you actually project the homophobia Absolutely. because you're trying to hide it yeah. and so many different things are just wound up in this but i i love this internal transformation of montrose just the joy in, in the exactly. moment you know and, and that that's what i mean by the direction of this of this particular scene the joy in that moment really does feel um <laughs> it feels so so relatable um uh, yeah for for what's going on in there and it's such an odd thing because in this episode, the opening of the episode, the closing of the last episode, this is the one character in the show, more than anybody else, I feel, that you're supposed to hate for what they've done. Um, like he is effectively, if you think of the narrative of the show, what's going on here is that uh, Letty and Atticus are trying to protect themselves, protect their family, protect everybody in their home by getting these 
pages from the Book of Adam and learning the spells so they can protect themselves. And for some, once again, unexplained reason right now, Montrose has killed the person that could translate them and destroyed the pages yeah, from the book. Exactly. He's taken away everything they worked for. And then we have this other storyline, this everything else that's going on inside his mind, kind of rending out his character, making him a 3D personality in, in this, in this show. Yes. And I love, I love that side of him. I love that he's had this release. I love that he's had this moment where he can actually be himself for the first time, even with these people. You know, we, as I say, we had heard that he'd never kissed Sammy before. So he's never even been himself with Sammy before. Sammy just knows that. He likes to have sex with men, basically, but he hopes that there's yeah. something more, you know? So that's the conflicting thing about the character of Montrose. He's not a traditional bad guy in the show. He's not a traditional, let's hate this guy, boo hiss. He's the evil father of, of Atticus who used to beat him as a kid. He's got a really complex storyline in, in this episode, particularly. I loved it. I loved how it was put across in this episode. Definitely. And it was great as well seeing, um, familiar drag queens yes. on the, from RuPaul's drag race. Mm-hmm. I certainly, there was, uh, Money Exchange and Shangela as well, yep. uh, which was really good to see, to see them do that kind of performance and it, it really kind of popped for me yeah i uh, really really enjoyed it two, and of course yeah, two of my favorite drag queens actually yeah, yeah and just really the like again it, it connects in with this concept of transformation of, yeah. and of being who you you are um it's just really really so fascinating um for me yeah i can't that that's my word of the day i think fascinating fascinating fascinating, <laughs> fascinating. absolutely I think uh, Spock used to say that a lot, John. He did, didn't he? <laughs> well, um, we should all live long and prosper. We should. We should, absolutely. Uh, hopefully, in this new form that Montrose has taken now, hopefully he lives long, live long and prospers uh, in this form. Because, you know, I, again, you know, as you say, the pressure of living up to all the societal norms he was surrounded by led him to effectively claim that Atticus is his son and bring him up badly though he did uh, beating him all the time you know he, he clearly had more in common with his uncle george who could potentially be his father so he's lived his life in a very different way uh, montrose has um and gone through it seemingly drunk for uh, for most of his adult life trying to cover up the side of himself maybe by accepting this he may be able to move on to a higher self as well as a better a better person so uh, so yeah loved that in this episode really really enjoyable but let's just talk quickly about to close out i suppose the overall episode let's talk quickly about um what's going on with the tick and letty side of the story because they have been the main characters for the first four episodes this episode seemed to talk about uh ruby and and atticus the kind of side characters in the show but do you want to do you want to quickly go through what's happening with their with what they're doing um it seems they're trying to translate photographs that yeah. Letty took because letty takes photographs of everything remember it's uh, the photographs so. and also the ring you know Atticus has managed to figure out at least three uh, letters based on the fact that they're his initials on the ring that was given to him by Christine. Mm-hmm. There's the photographs, um, all of this in order to try and help them and, and their own. Yeah. I, I think this is all going on. The, there's also a, the, the relationship of Atticus and Letty here where she's absolutely freaked out by his attack on his own father. Violence, yeah. You see her holding the baseball bat as she mm-hmm. goes down to try and see what's going on down in the cellar as he's looking for the the photographs. She's also still smarting from the fact of the knowledge that he was going to head off back down to Florida without telling her. Yep. But by the end of this episode, they, they seem to have come to that understanding um, between them that they do care and love one another. Absolutely. There's a great moment where Letty's in the bath and Ascus is there and it's really kind of tender moment, I thought. Yeah. And it kind of just reflects Ruby in a bath who's been wiping off all the blood with William, mm-hmm. yeah. which is much more business-like. So I thought that was a really good thing, this this sort of continuing little nudging of their relationship, um, yeah. for sure. I really enjoyed their discussion about love, you know, this idea that... Um, Tick doesn't have any idea of what love is because he had there was love around in his parents sort of it was just kind of this nominal thing but he's not, he doesn't really know what love is but he knows what he has with Letty is really special um and then Letty kind of responds going well I don't know what love is because 
love always seemed easy to me. Love seemed to be the thing that my mom fell into every single week with a different guy. So I had never known what love is either, you know? Um, so kind of made for each other is this, is this moment because, yeah, you know, definitely Atticus responding effectively that he knows that this thing, this relationship that they're going on is more special than anything else he's ever been involved in. But we do kind of hear a bit more about uh, the previous relationship that he was in, which was with a lady over in Korea, who we also get to hear on the phone at yes. the end of the episode. As Atticus translates this document, uh, I think we see the letters D-I-E written out on his uh, on his copy book, on his, on his yes. notepad. So unless he's just missing the last letter of diet and he's screaming at the idea that this <laughs> tablet might have to go is on a diet. To, to go on a well, diet. Well, that's a horror show anyway. It is. It is. I don't think he needs to go on a diet either. He's doing that. doing pretty well in comparison. <laughs> so, um, but yes, he calls her up on the phone and says to her, what is it that you know? She responds with, oh, you believe me now, don't you? And he says to her, what are you? Yes. So now that he's encountered all of these mysterious mystical forces over the course of the last uh, few weeks in Lovecraft country. He's seems to suspect that the person that he was calling out, I'm, I'm, t- I'm saying she's in Korea just purely because of the amount of numbers and the amount of digits he gave to the operator to call her. So I'm assuming this is his former partner who that ended weirdly as he describes it over in, uh, over in Korea. Yes. So I'm guessing that's who it is, but he seems to suspect that she's more than uh, the woman that he was going out with. It seems that she gave him information that he thought was just way out there and wacky. Yeah. Um, that he's just translated. Exactly. And is freaked out. And so, yes, given that the next episode title is Meet Me in Daigu, then I suspect he's possibly heading off to Korea. Maybe, maybe, yeah. I did have to look up Daigu when I saw the title for the next episode. Yeah, definitely a place in South Korea. So uh, he may be off there uh, to visit his former partner, or we may be getting a flashback to what happened with them uh, in the past, I suppose, before yes. he arrived back in the US. So, um, so yeah, some really interesting stuff on that, on that side of the storyline, but just a really small storyline uh, in the episode. So I think that's about everything uh, from the episode. Do you have any notes, Derek? Uh, a couple of interesting little touches in the episode. You know, it's weird that you mentioned that the transformation uh, of Ruby being like some monstrous transformations over time. Um, in that final scene where she, uh, where she uses the stiletto to hand in a resignation, as you've been saying throughout the episode, <laughs> we do see Wolfman on TV. So uh, that is a character that transforms into a wolf. You see him seeing himself in the mirror for the first time and freaking out. So, uh, so that is the transformation that's going on. Uh, also references to Frankenstein with the, uh, with the body that's in the, uh, in the wardrobe that looks like it's had some, uh, some other body attached or the head's been attached to a body or something like that that feels well, very Frankenstein-y. It does. I'm half wondering, is the head on the body in the closet the head that belongs to Captain Lancaster's body? Okay. Or, or something like that, uh-huh, you know? Maybe. Is he actually imitating the chief of police or Captain Lancaster, I should say? Yeah, maybe. By putting on his head onto his body yeah. and effectively storing his head, his head on it, somebody else's on <laughs> the captain's body in the closet that's a really interesting talk i don't know yeah. a stitch in time saves nine Maybe. nine minutes or nine right. lives or who knows <laughs> theories going all over the shop now just <laughs> it really is um, being an irish podcast we do have to call out uh, manager paul's uh, comment to um Hillary Ruby, uh, when she's in, uh, when she's going on her first day and he, and he says to her, um, I may not be the Blarney Stone, but hope you have a good day. Hope you have all the luck from me. <laughs> we have to point out, don't we? The truth of it is the we Blarney do. Stone has got magical properties. It's a, a stone in Ireland that you can go and kiss and it actually gives you the gift of the gab. It gives you the ability yes. to talk yourself out of any a situation. It comes from an old observation, particularly in America, about Irish people that they could always talk themselves out of any situation and the Irish person would respond saying, oh, well, I kissed the Blarney Stone when I was a kid and it turned into this whole <laughs> tourist thing where you come over and kiss the Blarney Stone and maybe you can have the look of the Irish effectively. So uh, so that's the, that's the magical uh, artifact that it they is. used from Ireland and the episode and it was just a piece of dialogue but we had to mention it yes we most certainly did the old blarney saying i've kissed it have you yeah i have never kissed it but i suppose i was born because uh, you have to go backwards uh, yeah. at the top of a castle wall uh looking down to the 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 ground below yes that's right yeah 
So I think after I kissed it, I kind of had to go to the loo very mm-hmm. quickly because <laughs> my fear of heights. But uh, yeah, I do a podcast now. So it obviously gave me the gift of the gab. There you go, John. <laughs> <laughs> that must be it. That must be it. <laughs> um, I just want to mention, I, I have said before, I've stopped reading the book, but there is a moment in the book which tells you why Ruby chose the name Hillary. Would you like to know? I certainly would. It's taken after Sir Edmund Hillary, who climbed Everest. Ah, okay. Yeah, because he was going into undiscovered country just like she was going into undiscovered country as a white woman. So the thought goes through her mind that she could be like an explorer. So she's yeah. really excited about the prospect of being a white woman for a while, has this idea that she's kind of going, oh, I'm an explorer in this situation. Interesting. Yeah, so she is herself. exploring. I, I yeah. think that's it. I think this is why it's so fascinating. There you go. Because <laughs> it is this exploration of your identity of yourself and if you in the case of ruby change that yeah. because of prejudice or despite prejudice you accept that identity as was happening with montrose exactly. so yeah really really good i think she even calls herself hillary everest the first time she introduces herself to somebody else but anyway just that's where she got the Hillary part of her name, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and that's it for my notes for the episode. Anything else to add, John? No, uh, it's uh, all noted for me. Excellent, excellent. What do you think of the episode overall, John? Um, this is my favourite one so far, to be Ooh, honest. Um, this is five bloody stilettos out of five. Wow. Um, I just loved the the themes that this was covering. Mm. Um, I found it so interesting. I thought Ruby uh, was just amazing here and her white woman counterpart, Hillary. Um, it was so well done. And with Montrose, that was just kind of like the the cherry on top for me um, to see that storyline in here yeah. running uh, alongside with, with Ruby's. Um, I just thought it was so so good um i and also your theory coming true what a great kind of moment i was like oh that's brilliant no i was just like that's brilliant (laughs) and and you you know again you're you're being teed up for the next episode with the phone call right at the end um so for me this was just really um superb um so yeah five bloody stilettos out of five, um, for sure. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, it's a weird one for me. Um, I think this was one of the best episodes of TV that I've enjoyed in a while. It's a really good episode of TV. As an episode of Lovecraft Country itself, I don't know. It's, it's kind of like, I don't know, if the show was, um, say, Twilight Zone, for example, um, I would point at this one and go, watch this episode. It's an excellent episode of The Twilight Zone, which is unconnected to all the rest of the episodes around it, if you know what I mean. Um, so I, so I give it a five out of five for being this anthology episode, the way I described the way some of these episodes okay. kind of feel like anthologies. The tie-ins were so few to all of the rest of the episodes that it felt like a standalone. We're going to explore the character of Ruby as a white woman. We're going to explore Montrose, a gay man who doesn't accept himself goes into violence and goes into drunken rages all the time and we're going to explore him accepting himself and those two stories themselves are absolutely great television really good they, they really are but yeah i think i described the being con- that connective tissue through with the so i i can see what you're yeah. saying but i felt the were really connective things in here to the other episodes yeah. and of course with tick and letty that was directly coming from from the last episode but that was a bit more to the background, um, for sure, on, yeah. in, in this episode. But, but I, I did like that connection of things like the Frankenstein Man, the the Hex, the um, the reference to Hiram uh, Epstein. All these different things was really good. Yeah, I agree. There were there were those kind of touches in there, but I think to not have a moment where Williams explaining why he's going after Ruby and why he's particularly interested in her as opposed to everybody else she even asked the question why are you more interested in us we had to piece together the fact that it's he needs to get into that house to get that that orrery 
And that's why he's going after Ruby as opposed to any other black woman within the whole city of Chicago. Uh, we have to piece that together from what our knowledge of the previous episodes of the show. So it feels like there are other opportunities within the episode to connect it a bit more into Lovecraft Country. Doesn't make it a bad episode of the show at all. It makes it a five star, five out of five episode of TV because there's so much great stuff dealt with really well in the episode. So I absolutely loved it as an episode of TV, but I suppose maybe next episode will tie it even further into Lovecraft Country as a series, I suppose. That's that's all I meant. So uh, really, really enjoyed it, though. Looking forward so much to episode six when it comes up. That's it overall for our discussion on the episode itself. Let's get yeah. a little bit of feedback on the last episode. Yes. Remember, fellow Dreadfuls, you can send in your thoughts all about Lovecraft Country to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. You can join us over on our Facebook group as well at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV Podcast Industries. We're also on Twitter as well, at TV Pod Industries. Mm -hmm. And you can head on over to our website, to tvpodcastindustries.com, and you can leave audio voicemail uh, of your thoughts, discussions on any of the episodes of Lovecraft Country. Um, Just click on the right-hand side tab and leave up to 90 seconds of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. With audio feedback in mind, we have a voicemail on episode four from Steve Brown. Hello, John and Derek. This, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, it, this Lovecraft country is confusing, man. Like, I, I feel like I gotta watch these episodes more than once just to, to keep up with what's going on, but I still want to send in a voicemail immediately after I watch it for the first time because, uh, just a couple quick things from this episode, uh, History of Violence, which, by the way, I love, it's absolutely a, a wonderful movie, History of Violence with, um, uh, Viggo Mortensen and, um, Oh, it's, it's, the, the name is escaping me now. It's going to kill me that I can't remember him. The guy from The Rock and, and, uh, and Harris. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's all beside the point. Uh, the kid at the beginning in the library just had me rolling and chuckling every time. And then that whole Indiana Jones sequence with the traps and the tunnels and the plank and uh it was really really great very very tense i uh, i didn't know what was uh, what was going to happen what was going on there and when letty went after the pages there in in the water with the elevator man uh just a really good episode again i'm going to have to watch it uh again really to to probably process everything because there was a lot lot going on um was that ruby that took the solar system out of the house and how did she get get it out of the house without anybody noticing um and i'm sure that's going to come into play later on but uh, anyway yeah just another good episode of lovecraft country and now i've got to go watch the boys uh episode again so i can answer the pub quiz pub quiz pub quiz question all right talk to you later (laughs) <laughs> excellent thanks so much for that steve yeah we're doing a pub quiz over on our uh boys podcast not on lovecraft country uh for this season but uh maybe if they get a second season we might do a, a pub quiz over there yeah i really hope so i love uh doing the pub quiz questions so hopefully we can uh start that up for season two the pub quiz questions gosh i, I Trying to think what I would uh, probably ask. But I non- presume, knowing your questions for Pope Quiz, it would be what size was the stiletto or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yes, thanks so much, Steve. Uh, just to uh, mention some of the things you, you mentioned on your voicemail, uh, it was Hippolyta that took the orrery, the, the solar system model. Um, again, it doesn't really say she sees it in the room uh, and then uh, she takes it home with her. In the book, it's much more simply put, she basically sees it. Letty knows she's an astrologer, um, that she's really interested in the stars. And she just says, can I have this? And nobody else wants it. And Letty says, yeah, no problem. Take it with you. So it's, it's as simple as that. I don't think the actual line was said in, in episode three. It may have just been a dropped line because it's such a simple thing to do, but we see her being really drawn to it when she sees it. And then it's now in her possession in, in the next episode. But you know, it's, it's, it's Aunt, Aunt uh, Hippolyta, you know, so she can take whatever she wants from the house. Why not? You know? Yeah. I mean, I loved the kid in the library as well. Oh, what yes, a great uh, scene with him sort yeah. of 
taking that role of the adults and telling the adults to to be quiet I'm in the library as he yeah exactly <laughs> yeah thanks so much steve great getting your thoughts there on episode four keep them coming in yeah um for sure absolutely and yeah this is a show that you have to watch multiple times i'm still not too sure whether they're actually going to get a second season i know i mentioned it there earlier on but this is translated from a book and it's cracking on or right the right pace of the book we're about halfway through right now in, in the book and the show so i don't know what, whether they will do a sequel to this it may be a completely different show for the second season so uh, we will see i guess as the show goes on but uh, i'm glad you're enjoying it i know it's confusing uh, when you watch it the first time though <laughs> thanks for the feedback steve uh, over on facebook on our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tv podcast industries donald dennis gave us his thoughts on episode four he says Though still a good episode, it is my least favourite of all the ones so far. It had some great highlights, but felt like it's a completely different style of show. More action-y, less suspense, more mummy, less Lovecraft. The puzzles weren't presented all that well. Someone cleaning the museum would have flipped that tooth. The board across the pit felt a bit cheap, stuff like that. Great thoughts you had about Christina also being William. Maybe she is also really a Aphrodite, but has to be one or the other instead of both at the same time. In all, still good, just not as compelling an episode for Donald. Well, we did find out in episode five that, uh, or how it works, I suppose, between uh, Christine and William. So I'm glad I caught that just before I had <laughs> in the episode before. But uh, but yeah, it doesn't seem like Christina is William. It seems like she's wearing the skin of William, which seems very, very creepy, actually, when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's it. Episode by episode, it's someone's cup of tea or it's not. Yeah. And I think um, for me last week, I really did enjoy it. Love the adventure. Um, but I can see that it, it does feel like it is taking you out of the, the, the moment of, I suppose that road trip and with the, the hell house from episode three. But I, I, I did feel this was, uh, it was more mummy and the, that, I suppose that ancient horror of mummification mm -hmm. and, and their own horrific tales of the underworld yeah. uh, and so on. So I, I really kind of like this. And certainly with Yahima, the South American first people, and mm -hmm. um, that was just awesome for me. Yeah. Uh, absolutely loved it. Yeah. Um, As for the person in the museum that, flipped, that could have flipped the tooth, someone cleaning the museum who could have flipped the tooth, I actually think it's connected to the power of the moon that sh it's not just that it shines a light on the tooth you have to move i feel like the uh the light from the moon is yeah. what is what gave it the power to open that's what i thought as well yeah. they some kid walking past just pushing yeah, the tooth exactly the what the hell's the pit going on here because yeah. you would be putting your hand or your head into those um jaws of the the crocodiles absolutely yes yeah. i've seen you do it john <laughs> Yeah, I, I would do it only for a statue why of a crocodile yeah, that's and true. not a real one. I did see a program where people do put yeah, their heads yeah. in the mouths of cr live crocodiles yeah. with them wide open. And you kind of go, you do realize the bite pressure of these animals. Yeah. They are so strong, so fierce. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. For a big clock. <laughs> I think I was within 12 inches of a, uh, of a crocodile. I never want to be anywhere close to, close that close to one again. Thank you so much for your thoughts, Donald. Thanks so much, Steve, for your voicemail. Again, if you want to send in any thoughts to us, email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Donald and Steve for, uh, the feedback. Really, really good. Thank you as well, fellow dreadfuls for joining us. We hope you stay subscribed to the podcast. And if you enjoy what you hear, why not share it with your friends? Sharing the podcast is, of course, sharing the love. Absolutely. You can support us in oh so many ways. Uh, sharing the podcast, rating us, subscribing, leaving a review, or you can uh, also become a patron uh, at patreon.com forward slash TV podcast industries. All your support is very much appreciated. All your feedback and the community we have is really, really appreciated. And of course, your listenership is also really, really appreciated. Absolutely. Yeah. We are halfway through Lovecraft Country. We are also halfway through the boys on TV podcast industries as well. Make sure you go over to TV podcast industries.com. Check out all our podcasts over there. We are covering the boys and Lovecraft Country at the same time. We got a f piece of feedback over on Twitter uh, asking us if we're going to do a wrap up, maybe at the end of the season, could we pick out the things that are uh, similar about Lovecraft Country and the boys <laughs> and I'm trying to work out how could we do a, a podcast about that John could we do a podcast where we just talk about all the things that are synergized between those two shows 
I'm not I, even sure I they have think, the same audience. I think the challenge has been set. I, I think, think we be. could. I, but I think we would also have to say where it does differ. But we will yeah. accept the challenge of <laughs> where are these two shows similar when we do our roundup. At least maybe on the boys podcast where we will be doing a roundup episode yeah. uh, in order to provide the results for the pub quiz True. and the final feedback for episode eight of the boys. Yeah. So um, we can certainly bring in a bit of Lovecraft c- country into that episode. <laughs> but if you listen to both shows, we'd love to hear uh, who you are. We know Steve is because we forced Steve to send in a voicemail to us every week. <laughs> so, so we know, sorry, Steve, but thanks very much for listening to all the podcasts. And we hope you're enjoying both shows. And I'm sure they're very different like ourselves. Uh, we find a bit of light relief over in the boys most of the times after doing Lovecraft country. But, uh, but there's also a lot of fun in Lovecraft country as well. Yes. The really is a lot of fun. Uh, the characters are really good and as well, just a bit of horror, mm-hmm. social, you know, pertinent social commentary yep. and, and done in really interesting ways. So, uh, yeah, cannot wait for the next episode of Lovecraft Country. And of course, that will be next week when we'll be back with Lovecraft Country season one, episode six. Meet me in Daigu. Thank you so much for joining us. Talk to you again next time. Bye. Yes, thank you so much, fellow Dreadfuls, for joining us. It is, as always, a pleasure. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and keep transforming. Ooh, nice. Bye. Keep metamorphosizing. (laughs) Transforming is definitely better. Keep changing. (laughs) Don't stop changing. Like us. Bye. Bye. Bye.